And we're back. Yay. Yay. Our next speaker is Kit Bradford. Kit Bradford is a research scientist affiliated with the MIT Media Lab. His work focuses on how we heat and cool things. His background is, it's impressive, it's in biomechanical and electrical engineering, and he's also an expert in HVAC systems, which is weirdly a subject that we talk about every single time we hang out. He's a founder of a few startups in the temperature control and medical device fields, and he holds a whole bunch of patents for his inventions. Kip brings a lot of his devices to, ev to events. I don't think he's brought any here because they would have to go on a plane. But recently, like a couple of weeks ago, he brought a cold plate where we were making ice cream in the back of a conference, which was a pretty interesting thing to have happen. This talk is about Kip's work in, con in controlling climates at every scale, even the weather, which should be very interesting. Please join me in welcoming Kip Bradford to the Hackaday Super Conference stage. Thank you. Let's see. Yeah. Put that up there. Cool. Um, so I find myself standing between you and lunch. Um, I know the other stages are a little bit behind, but I'll go a little bit quickly. Uh, and if you have questions, just find me at lunch. That's easy. Um, as Sophie said, I am interested in devices that control climates. And I'm gonna take you through a little bit of a story. Uh, in 2015, I was hired at the MIT Media Lab after a job search for a professor of other. And after I got hired, uh, Nicholas Negroponte, who created the job search, calls me into his office and says, here's the thing. We're gonna give you two years to create a new field of science, and if everybody likes it, then you are basically senior faculty at the Media Lab, and that's gonna be awesome. Um, but the catch is that your new field has to have magic and impact. So I thought to myself, this is totally insane. Um, inventing a new field at MIT that's supposed to be more important than any other field existing at MIT at that time, uh, and doing it in an order of months so I could act actually work on the projects was um, an totally improbable task. So I'll tell you the story, but I can basically summarize a little bit of this and say, I gave up after about six months and just decided to work on something that I care about, and this is the result of that. Uh, I'm working to solve two challenges. One is smarter heating and cooling so that we can have more efficient buildings and also more comfortable people. And the second is trying to figure out new ways to pump heat um, where there are none existing today. And the goal of that work is to reduce global warming. So um, I'll take you back a little bit, if you'll allow me, uh, before I get into the details of the projects themselves and tell you how I got here. Uh, a few of the critical events that set me on the course that I'm on today. Uh, the first event happened in 1973, and that was the Rowland Molina hypothesis that proposed that our ozone layer was being quietly destroyed by man made chlorine. Um, the second event was uh, for the world maybe a little bit less exciting, but for me was uh, pretty traumatic. I was born in New Jersey, and that location. Um, is very important because my parents are from New Orleans and that factors into the story pretty prominently. So chlorine in the upper atmosphere, destroying the ozone layer. Um, where did it come from? Well, it turns out that in the 30s, we invented this clever little molecule called Freon, uh, AKA, well, Freon 12 to be specific, AKA dichlorodifluoromethane. Um, I'll spare you too much chemistry today because none of you look like chemists. Um, but Freon-12 was really important because it made refrigeration and air conditioning completely practical. And this is important because it allows us to have our cold glass of Mr. Juicy in the morning without worrying about dying from listeria. But it's not like refrigeration was a new thing. This stuff had existed before. As a matter of fact, it existed for decades. Um, it's just that the substances that we used in refrigeration and air conditioners tended to do this. 
they were explosive, they were toxic, or both explosive and toxic, which is kind of the worst of both worlds. So things like refrigerators and air conditioners tended to blow up and kill people or leak and kill people um, or blow up and leak and kill people. And that's a bit of a problem. So in the 1930s, some chemists got together um, and set the chemical industry upon discovering new chemicals, new ways, new compounds that were stable, that were less toxic, but had the same kind of wonderful effects of being able to make cold. And if you know anything about chemistry, well, you know that the carbon-hydrogen bond is a very high-energy bond that's very easy to break bond, which is why we have gasoline, we have things like jet airplanes, power plants. It's a wonderful thing in the carbon-hydrogen bond, unless you're trying to do refrigeration, and in that case, it causes the problems that we have. So chemists thought, well, let's try to replace the hydrogen with something a bit more stable. Turns out that chlorine and fluorine, if you replace those hydrogen bonds with chlorine carbon bonds or fluorine carbon bonds, you have a much more stable molecule that's perfectly biologically inert, um, except for this whole ozone problem. So uh, another thing that happened as a result of this work was we created this explosion-free stuff called Freon. We also, as an accidental result of research into this world, created Teflon. So over the next half century, all of these materials that were invented in the 30s started to silently and destructively eat away at our ozone layer. Um, the ozone layer, which you might know, protects us from lots of harmful uh, ultraviolet radiation. So fast forward a little bit to 1985 and the next two events in our story. Um, one thing that was really cool that happened was that the Rowland Molina hypothesis about this ozone chlorine relationship was proven. Um, the global scientific community verified that this was indeed the case, that chlorine does destroy uh, ozone. And they thought, well, if this is the case, well, we're probably losing our ozone layer. We should check. And a bunch of uh, surveys were conducted, and indeed, we were losing our ozone. So scientists got together and said, we need to do something about this, because if this continues, basically, solar radiation will kill us all by uh, the year 2100. There will be uh, no chance of life on Earth because we won't be able to grow food um, unless we have massive ultraviolet uh, protection schemes covering our cities, covering our farms, and that's just not going to happen. It'll be much, much easier if we just figure out a way to get the ozone layer back. Well, the simplest way to do that is to eliminate the chlorofluorocarbons. And in 1985, the first global treaty that every single country in the world signed um, was created and signed to eliminate this ozone problem. Uh, that happened in Vienna. It's called the Vienna Convention. The second thing that happened in 1985 was the founding of the MIT Media Lab. So MIT, like lots of other top institutions, likes to create amazing science. But all that amazing science doesn't really have an impact on the world for decades. And a couple people at MIT thought, well, we have some of the best scientists in the world, if not all of the best scientists in the world. That's a whole MIT thing. We should probably change this. What if we did great science, but then also had a group of people trying to translate that science into impact? And the Media Lab was born as a place for those big ideas. What does it mean to take the most advanced science that's happening, that's coming out of the labs of any university around the world, and funnel that through a center at MIT where we could think about the biggest things, the most impossible things, the most amazing things that we could do with science. So Nicholas Negroponte and Jerome uh, Weisner, who at the time was the president of MIT, saw the potential to remove layers and layers of bullshit uh, between getting stuff from lab into society. Um, they succeeded on a lot of those layers. There's still plenty of academic politics, but for the most part, it's a pretty innovative place. And I would say from 1985 to 2014, probably one of the most innovative research groups in the world, but 30 years in, other people had caught on. Other people had caught on to the fact that lots of businesses wanted to be part of this innovative disruption that was happening. So places like Stanford, Berkeley, um, University of Michigan, et cetera, also started to create very, very innovative research groups and were chipping away at the dominance that the Media Lab had. 
So what do you do when your only product is innovation? That's how you get 24 researchers who are bringing in $100 million per year or so um, to stay at the forefront of innovation. Well, you build a new building, clearly. That's the solution, um, which is what they did. But then in 2015, they did something else um, that was pretty awesome, which is they put out a call for a professor of other with no job description, and it said, surprise us. So that's pretty cool. That's fairly disruptive. Like, you can't do that at a university, just put out a job call with, with no description. But they did. And um, I was one of the weirdos who applied for this job. Uh, as Sophie had mentioned, I have a fairly weird background. Uh, my first job out of college was a toy inventor, and I did that professionally for 10 years, despite being a biomedical engineer had numerous startups in the, the biomed space, um, was racing bicycles semi-professionally, and also happened to do this little thing for fun, uh, which was HVAC. Um, and I'll get to why that was a thing that I did, but the first question that people asked me when I was at MIT was, can you fix the air conditioning in this building? I was like, you know I've got multiple degrees in continuum solved biomechanics from you know, a local university that happens to actually be pretty good. I know it's not MIT, but I think it's pretty good. And my colleagues were like, yeah, but this building sucks. The air conditioning is always too cold. The heating is always too hot. Unless you're in a room where the air conditioning is too hot and the heating is too cold, wherever you are in the building, you're gonna be uncomfortable. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you want me to be your licensed HVAC technician uh, while paying me a senior research scientist salary on tenure track, great, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but my initial response wasn't that. My initial response was basically, go fuck off. <laughs> if you want a plumber, hire a fucking plumber. If you want a research scientist, you've got one. Um, but funny thing, with all of the projects I was proposing, all the, the new fields, like I had been developing economic theory uh, as a consultant, basically, for companies like Intel and Texas Instruments, Ingersoll Rand. And all of that work led to some great inspirational visions about programming languages and what economic theory around innovation should look like and uh, empirical and theoretical formula. But my colleagues, and I had five mentors, including Nicholas, and then one secret mentor, which was Neil Gershenfeld, who was a friend before I was at MIT, five colleagues who would hammer on me and just be like, yeah, that, that economic theory, that'd be great if you were an economics professor, but you're not, you're a media lab professor. So what are you gonna make that's gonna change the world? And it can't be math. It's gotta be something physical. After six months of that and uh, hearing things like, you cannot climb someone else's mountain. You must build your own mountain. Then you must climb the mountain that you have built. What is your mountain? which was a meeting that I had with, I will not mention the faculty member, but <laughs> inspirational words that my first response was, holy shit, this is completely pointless. What am I trying to do? I'm never gonna satisfy five different mentors with five different ideas about what su success looks like, plus still be able to make it in uh, MIT and have created magic and impact. So I just said, you know what? Uh, yeah, self-capitation, that's, that's about where we're at. So forget about that, I'm gonna do something fun and meaningful for myself. I decided to make devices that control climates. And part of the reason for this was, as I said, I grew up in the Northeast, I was born in New Jersey, my parents were from New Orleans, and that had profound impact that I'll get to in a moment. But first, I have to bring us back to this whole ozone thing. Um, Humanity caused a hole in the ozone layer, releasing refrigerants, and we're able, we have been able to reverse this, which is pretty impressive. So people who doubt that humans can have this impact at a global scale and be able to reverse that impact, well, we have a counterexample that's a pretty powerful one. And that counterexample was instituted based on the political will, so not engineering, not technology, but politicians getting together and saying, this is not the world that we want to live in with infrared uh, or ultraviolet radiation bombarding us and killing us. 
we should fix this problem. So humanity came together, we had the Montreal Protocol, we solved a global scale environmental problem. And that was a pretty big deal. So as that problem got solved, there was something in the background lurking even more sinister, which was this. All of those refrigerants happened to be tens of thousands of times more reflective to infrared radiation than carbon dioxide is. And we've been talking about the fact that the planet's getting warmer. So people are using more and more air conditioning and more and more refrigeration, causing the release of more refrigerants, also causing the release of more CO2. So it turns out that air conditioning and refrigeration, the stuff that we're using to get cool, is also the cause of about 40% of the heating of the planet, which is a very, very bad death spiral to be in. So why do we need air conditioning in the first place? This is the biomedical engineer in me. Normal core body temperatures, if you vary outside of them by a little bit on the hot side, a little bit on the cold side, you die. So thermal regulation is really critical. It so happens that our bodies have some really great mechanisms built in that allow us to keep ourselves warm on hot days and cool, uh, cool on hot days and warm on cold days. One slide too far. But turns out that our planet does not cooperate with us very much. So we have done what I call the first thermal revolution. By the way, humans are probably the best species on the planet for thermal regulation. If you've ever heard of pursuit predation, anyone here of pursuit predation? It's kind of this awesome thing where I don't care what kind of animal you are, I as a human being will chase you until you exhaust yourself to death. I can outrun a horse if the race is 200 miles long. Yes, the horse can sprint for a short period of time, but I can just saunter along at a happy like eight miles an hour for hours on end. And then at some point the horse will just drop dead and I will have food. It's badass. <laughs> so humans have evolved the most advanced thermal regulation mechanisms in our bodies. But we've gone even further and we've discovered that, oh, we can wrap ourselves with clothes and we can make fire. And clothes prevent heat flow, but fire lets us actually generate heat where there was none before. Clothes will keep us warm or cool, depending on what we need, but we didn't quite have cold on demand. We had access to ice. That's not the same thing. It's like, if it's cold somewhere and you've got a boat, you can harvest some ice, you can sail your boat to where it's hot. But we had a second thermal revolution uh, in 1851, a guy named John Gorey, who was a doctor, actually, the Biomedical Engineering Cooling Connection again, patenting a crude device for creating ice on demand with steam and compressed air. Uh, people thought this was the work of the devil. It was amazing, the social response. Again, it was not a technological response. People were like, oh, yeah, okay, you just made ice. That's cool. But society was like, you can't do that. God gave us heat. You're taking that away. You're evil. I mean, literally, it became a religious thing. And Gory eventually committed suicide. Uh, that's unsubstantiated. There's claims that he committed suicide, but he died an early death, I'll say that. So it took another 65 years and changes in social mores um, and new advances in technology for Willis Carrier to be able to commercialize these technologies that other people had invented. He made them more efficient. He made business models around them, and we know Carrier uh, as the father of modern air conditioning today. So Willis Carrier, 1815, we get cold on demand. By the way, refrigerators blowing up, remember that. It took another 15, 20 years before that problem went away as well. Um, so we all want the benefits of being able to control heat. We want our food to be fresh and healthy and safe. Um, we want Manufacturing, like I don't want chocolate that's melted. That's a huge problem in the chocolate, chocolate industry. Food refrigeration is a big deal. Um, all of you using computers, if we turn off refrigeration, your computing stops. All of those server farms die. Pharmaceuticals, obviously personal air conditioning, uh, lots more. But 
100 years after Willis Carrier, the gold standard for building design is that 80% of the occupants in your building don't complain about how shitty your building is, comfort-wise. That is the ASHRAE mechanical engineering standard to which every building is designed. Not 80% of the people are happy with your building, but 80% of the people don't complain about how shitty the building is. It doesn't actually say shitty in there, but everyone knows that it says that. And that's what it means. So people are dissatisfied with building comfort, despite the fact that we have air conditioning. Um, cooling is a massive component of the energy use in data centers. It's a massive drain on energy for residential use, and as I said, is also causing a lot of our global warming. To make matters worse, this is what innovation looks like in this world. In 2014, the invention of the variable speed compressor revolutionized industrial HVAC. You know what a variable speed compressor is? Somebody shout it out. It's a DC fucking motor in 2014. In 2015, the revolutionary Daikin internet connected air conditioner using an Intel Curie module or something like that. And then in 2017, I forgot what 2016 was, I don't think I took a picture or somebody might have chased me out of the venue when I was trying to take a picture because they knew I was doing this. 2018, an adaptive water pump that detects when you are most likely to use hot water and circulates hot water from your water heater so that you don't have to run your water tap for too many seconds before the hot water comes up. This is innovation in this world. By the way, this industry is bigger than the electronics industry. It's like every single one of us has more HVAC products than we have computers. And I'm gonna show you a little video, which will hopefully um, be as funny as I think it is to you as well. Here's a little story that needs to be told about AC heat. It's gonna be cold. We sit in our house just chilling all day. Not even thinking who made it that way. And now y'all know your homies will say, don't play me like that. What is an ash rate? Mac Daddy stuff for heating and air. Plus sit the ozone in our atmosphere. We got our five, six, two, chill. Ain't cool to be hot. Got our five. We do it all, from uh, critical buildings to hospitals. I do all kinds of different projects. HVC is not a sexy job, but it's very fun, it's very rewarding. Hi, Serena. I get the opportunity to crawl through buildings. I don't have to sit behind a desk. The airplane that you fly to spring break on. We preserve the cold chain and allow food to be shipped all over the world. We're very critical to the functioning of the world. Engineers are behind every computer, building, structure. Penguin enclosure. Being a young engineer has given me the opportunity to do projects in Cairo, Panama, and Budapest, Hungary. Acting as an engineer, you'll get to travel the world and see designs in every country. Big cities, small towns, everyone needs engineers. As an HVAC engineer, you have the opportunity to work in a huge and diverse industry. I design biological safety labs, zoos, your... The next time that you go from a sweaty, humid climate to a comfortable one, say, thank you, Mr. HVAC and our engineer. Thank you to Mr. and Ms. HVAC and our engineer. Although we keep you cool, CFCs are never blown. Global warming's in the house, but we help the ozone. Saving the planet, we like the earth this way. Put a Superman S on the chest of Ash Ray. We're the kings of cool, head honchos of heat. We'll keep it running smooth, ice chilling like this beat. To maintain human comfort, we use up a tremendous amount of global resources, faster than many are willing to admit. Green design and sustainability are 
for our children and for our children's children. Green design is the best chance we have to make a difference for the future. It's the environment, stupid. It's our gift to our children's children. It is extremely important that we make great changes for the future generations to come. Kermit lied. It's easy to be green. It's the environment, stupid. Sustainability, I think uh, that our profession has a responsibility to uh, make sure that we um, provide for not only our generation, but future generations. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, what will the world be like if we do not change? Bring it ice to the desert, heat to Tibet. Third world ice dreams and a thermal heat jet. That's just a taste, like a sample in the song. The list of things we do goes on and on and on. Now, word to your future, be scoring cold cash. It's served on a platter, don't make me kick your ass. Raise the bomb, we act like you're on board. Just click on the link, ashray.org. We got a line, six, two, chill, ain't cool, we hot. Line, six, two, chill, ashray on top. Ashray is a great society. Ashray. It's a wonderful society for students because it does help them to network. Sweet. Joining Ashray is a great way to get involved in sustainability. Ashray. Yo, yo, yo. Ashray's got a license to chill. License to chill. <laughs> you have to have like biceps or some arms to do. <laughs> license to chill. If this goes on the video, I'm out All right, so if you can read the subtext down here, it's new rap video designed to encourage students to consider engineering as a career, you know, specifically with HVAC engineering. And if the students that this was designed for hadn't like gotten up and fled midway through that video, um, I'd be impressed. So this is the video promoting the future of this massive field which is eating up all of our energy and destroying our planet. And that's what we're looking at to try to get people excited. Um, that's a problem. That is a big problem. So my goal was to solve that problem. And my proposal is essentially starting a third thermal revolution. So my work at MIT was launching 35 research projects in parallel um, at the beginning with no graduate students, just me in a lab with torches building stuff. And I'm gonna very quickly take you through the things that I'm building and uh, that will conclude my talk. So before I was at MIT, I had a, an air conditioning startup and the idea was that I wanted to change window air conditioners. Remember I said that I was born in New Jersey, my parents are from New Orleans. Well, that meant on a cold day, which for my mom was like 70 degrees, we'd have the heat on. For me, a cold day is like, I'll be in shorts in 32. So having air conditioning in my bedroom would have been really nice, but we had central AC in the house, it just didn't get to my room. So my room was always hot, I was always, always miserable, and I was always tinkering with ways to actually make little air conditioning systems. And 20 years later, that led me to um, this little invention, which won a bunch of design awards, but essentially, it was just about making myself cooler and more comfortable. Um, one of the ways that I wanted to do that was, why are we cooling all of the air in this building when the thing that we want to be cooling is the people who are in the room? There's a lot of wasted energy that goes to delivering thermal comfort to that piece of wood that doesn't really give a shit. Instead, if we moved the source of heat or move the source of cold closer to people, well, that makes a lot of sense. I set about designing a bunch of tools to be able to make systems that could make cold um, and end up developing an expertise with basically personal thermal comfort systems. 
um, I took some of those personal thermal comfort systems and developed funky things like the chair conditioner. Yes, I thought that was a great name too. Um, it turns out that chair conditioning is a completely impractical thing, but it's super fantastic to sit in a chair and flip a switch and have your back ice over on a hot day. It's a lot of fun. But more practically, um, it turns out some researchers at Stanford discovered that you can pump up to 70% of the excess heat out of the body through either the palms or the soles of the feet because there's a specialized network of heat exchange blood vessels. So an air-conditioned footrest would actually be a lot more practical. So made one of those. And as long as I'm making personal thermal systems, um, well, people in a lot of different situations would love to have a air-conditioned backpack, like at Burning Man. Um, but it turns out that there's some much more useful and serious <laughs> applications. Um, there was an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago about how male infertility is significantly increasing in the Middle East. It also happens to be happening at the same time that extreme temperatures are in parallel increasing in the Middle East. There is a correlation between fertility and temperature. So if you don't believe in global warming, that's okay. You will still be buying my air-conditioned underwear in 15 years. Um, on a slightly, well, that's actually a big market, and there's a product that's in development for that uh, that I'm working on, but for a more, a, a less elective medical application, if you have multiple sclerosis, uh, last year, two years ago, one of the Hackaday Prize um, entries was somebody trying to make a, an air-conditioned backpack for people who have, who have MS where you can't actually control your body's temperature. So you can have a heat stroke if it's 85 degrees out because your body just doesn't thermoregulate. All that awesome stuff that lets us do pursuit predation, predation, when that breaks down, it's a really, really miserable thing. So MS is one, as I said, uh, testicular cooling. Um, another great application where people will pay a lot of money is sports. Turns out that cooling the palms or cooling the feet, you can generate more performance enhancement than with anabolic steroids for athletes. So there are some sports teams, which I am not allowed to name, um, that are working with these Stanford researchers to apply these technologies. There are a bunch of interesting adjacent possibilities like medical refrigeration, um, doing household refrigerators right, like your food always spoils because it's always at the wrong temperature putting tomatoes in your fridge and having them be at 35 degrees is a really bad thing to do. Putting meat in your fridge and having it be at 45 degrees is a really bad thing to do. So trying to find that happy medium is impossible. But if you had an eight zone refrigerator, well, that's a fantastic thing. Um, turns out digital urban agriculture, any kind of uh, agriculture where you're inside an enclosure, you need a ton of refrigeration. But in buildings, one of the fun things is humans sense heat through different mechanisms. Right now, we're conducting heat away from our bodies into the air, but we're also getting infrared uh, conduction and reflection from all the surfaces. So some friends of mine and I designed a pavilion for the Seoul Biennale uh, a couple months ago where you walk through, the room is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but the front of you feels like it's about 100 and the back of you feels like it's about 50 because we have radiant heat panels that face you and radiant cold panels that face your back, which is a super neat effect and that was a, a lot of fun um, trying to teach graduate students from Princeton how to be good plumbers, speaking of plumbing. Um, I'll show you another quick video. There are other people who are doing some great work. Um, it's not just the stuff that I'm doing to disrupt this world and here's one of them. So that's a textile which responds to your body's temperature. Instead of having to have air conditioning cranking up in the building and making all of us uncomfortable, why don't your clothes modulate better? So there are a number of teams around the country that are actually funded by the Department of Energy who are working on some of that. Uh, this lists a few of them. 
But I'm gonna close with my signature project, which addresses the question of can we make cold without making heat? Now, if you know anything about the second law of thermodynamics, literally that's impossible. It just doesn't happen, and if I had discovered a way to make it happen, I wouldn't be standing here, I'd be at the patent office with a great patent for a perpetual motion machine. And if you want to know the thermodynamics behind that, I'll chat at lunch. But if you look at the thermodynamics of a system like the globe, it turns out that we have a heat source and we have a heat sink. And we don't need to deal with the second law of thermodynamics. We just need to move the heat away from the heat source into the heat sink. That heat sink happens to be outer space, almost absolute zero. We have a ton on the, of heat on this planet, and the heat stays on the planet because we have this wonderful thing called carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which reflects enough of that heat down to the surface of the Earth to keep the Earth comfortably warm. But if we put too much CO2 or too much of the CFCs or HFCs or HCFCs up in the atmosphere, all of that reflection starts adding up, the planet gets too warm. So some of my colleagues at uh, another institution, uh, principally Harvard, um, have proposed a solution which involves flying a bunch of airplanes around the world continually for like 10 years, spreading diamond dust and sulfur dioxide particles in the upper atmosphere with the idea that these are highly reflective to incident light. And if the sunlight hits these reflective things, before it hits the surface of the Earth, it bounces back into space. Once it reaches the surface of the Earth, it warms the Earth and then is re-radiated as infrared, which then bounces back and forth. So you want to stop the infrared from happening in the first place by getting the sunlight, the visible spectrum, out into space before it reaches the surface. Um, that's something that would probably work. We have seen its effect when we've seen volcanic eruptions. The issue is that there's no off switch, there's no control knob, there's no thermostat. You put this stuff up in the atmosphere and it drifts around and the planet gets cold and if I want it to be a little bit warmer, well, too bad. So I have developed a better solution, uh, which I call reflective water, which uses technologies that I'm already very familiar with and comfortable uh, with, which is compressors. I can compress air, I can make micro bubbles, and I'm gonna show you the effects of that. If you read the luminance meter at the bottom, 83 watts per meter of incident light, I turn on my bubble generator. And that just went down to 3.6 watts per meter. And that's with only two feet of water. So the benefits of reflective water, it's controllable. I can turn it on and off. It's local. I have to have millions of devices to create reflective water around the oceans, which means that if somebody tries to hack my system, well, I can get in a rowboat and I can row out to one of the devices and I can press the reset button and I can row back before anything really bad happens. And at night, I can turn the system off, and the infrared that does make it, uh, or the sunlight that does make it to water, warming the water up and turning it into infrared radiation, I can let that reflect back out into space. So I don't have this reflective mirror that I just built in the upper atmosphere trapping incident light from above, but also incident uh, IR from below. It also gives me the ability to tweak climate models, like I can heat up areas and I can cool down areas and figuring out like, does a hurricane cause droughts in certain areas or do drought in cert droughts in certain areas cause hurricanes? We can actually start to get correlation with our scientific models. So I am working on, and this was just presented actually to US Congress a couple days ago, a network of controllable pixel-sized bubble generators. And when I say pixel size, like a couple square kilometer pixels. Um, what's interesting about that is it doesn't just reduce the temperature of the planet, but because they're pixels, thermal pixels, I can actually influence the weather. Um, and I've been able to sidestep the whole conversation about global warming by saying, you know, forget about global warming. Do you want to be able to control the weather? I want to steer hurricanes away from the US. That would be awesome. So, summarizing, Couple challenges to solve, and ASHRAE is not solving it with rap videos. Smarter heating and cooling with efficient buildings, making people comfortable. 
new ways to pump heat that reduce global warming and give us the ability to modify the weather. And that's all. You're free to go to lunch. Thank you.